I was born in Piedras Negras, Mexico, which is a small town on the border between Texas and Mexico. It's called Piedras Negras because it means black rocks. It means it's a town that made its living from coal mining. Um, I grew up there. My dreams and desires growing up was to become an auto mechanic. Uh, but I happened to run into a Methodist missionary while I was living in Mexico. And this Methodist missionary would encourage me to look beyond just being an auto mechanic taught me a little bit of English uh, and encouraged me to consider going to uh, high school in the United States. And it was, you know, it's, uh, several of us did that every day. We would cross the border, show our passport, go to school, and then return home that night. And, uh, and I'll make a long story short, in my high school, I was able to actually graduate as valedictorian of the high school. And, and as a result of that, um, I was offered the opportunity to attend the University of Texas on a Good Neighbor Scholarship. I received a phone call from my father my freshman year. I was a transfer. October 1979, it is etched in my brain as my life was to change. The Civil War in El Salvador had erupted. I came from the volcano. I came from an idyllic life. And everything was being put on my lap at a very early age. The phone call went like this. You cannot come back. Your life is in danger. You must open your path in the United States. Oh my God, what a huge country to conquer. And I was being set to do that. So I was born in Santiago, Chile, and we came to the US when I was seven months old. When I was a, a kid in, in grade school, they put me in an ESL class, mainly because my father had an accent, I believe. Um, even though English was really my first language. My name is Maricela Alarcón. I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. And growing up was really about needs as opposed to wants. Um, I grew up with Spanish-speaking parents, both of them immigrants from Mexico. And we lived well below the national poverty level. My father made about $15,000 a year. And he worked nights and he worked during the day as well. I didn't realize that I was poor I would say, until um, I came to Rice. When we came to the United States, I was 11 or 12, um, didn't have much in the way of, of, of um, you know, luxuries. In fact, we had two suitcases. One suitcase, as my mom likes to say, was full of pots and pans, and the rest had all the clothes for the entire family, five kids and two parents. So we didn't have a lot. And in particular, they didn't really know a lot about the system here in the United States. So neither one of them had gone to college. Uh, and so I was the first one to go to college, and everything was new. Everything was strange. By the time I arrived at Rice, I had been in the United States about a little under nine years. So to a large degree, I was still very much an immigrant. The, I'm the eldest of five, first in the family to go to college in the United States, yet alone leave home. I was born in Argentina, and the concept is that you live at home until, uh, generally speaking, until you ultimately get married. You know, when I think back on my high school, um, I came from an inner city school here in Houston. Uh, if I recall my freshman year, there were probably about eight, 900 students in the auditorium. When we graduated, there were less than 400. My package in the mail came, and I was very nervous when that larger package in the mail came. Um, and the person who opened it was my mom. Uh, i never forget that day where she was really excited that I had, I had been accepted to Rice. Rice was always seen as that top school. I had heard about it for so long, especially growing up here in Houston, and here was my dream. Here was my chance. Uh, I remember my dad saying, you know, uh, it's a little expensive, but I'm going to write this check, and you're going to be able to compete with the big dogs, was, was kind of his, his phrasing. And so I walked into the Sally Port. I was here for four years, graduated as an engineer, became the first engineer in my family, first person with a master's degree in my entire extended family. And here I am, a Rice grad twice. It was so much fun the first time. It was important to me to come to Rice because the family really couldn't afford college. And the Rice Institute was tuition free. I paid for room and board, books, and I had a small allowance, $20 a month. I could spend any way I wanted and when the time came for me to want to go to graduate school, which I wanted to do, um, I started looking around the country to see the places where I could go to. And one of the advice one of the teachers gave me, which ended up being a phenomenal advice, was 
you got to go someplace where you like the people you're going to be working with. And so I started traveling around the country, visiting various schools, and uh, that's how I ended up choosing Rice. And frankly, uh, for a kid like myself, from where I came from, uh, it was like a fantasy. It was like living in a, in a storybook uh, story. It's, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I asked around to see which of the universities uh, were really good, and Rice was always at the top of everybody's list. And growing up in Houston, that was the university everybody wanted to go into. When I applied for Rice, the counselor at the high school that helped me apply indicated that I would not be accepted and didn't want me to have high expectations for that. So after I got in, then I began to wonder whether I had gotten in by mistake and somebody was going to wake up and find out that maybe I didn't belong here. <laughs> I brought to Rice something different. I was an international student. I didn't even know I was Hispanic. That word got thrown at me somewhere around my sophomore year. And I said, what is that? I knew what the meaning of Hispanic means. It means the Hispanic Peninsula, Spain, proceeding from that area with that language. But I had no idea that this was to be the label for me for the rest of my life in America, where I was to, to make it my home. Well, the, the Hispanics weren't, weren't a separate class. I mean, you know, there, there were very few of us, I think, um, I had, I guess, in the five year, in the four years I was an undergraduate, I made a, might have met maybe ten Hispanics on campus. The truth is that when I was an undergraduate uh, at Rice, there were very few Latinos here. Uh, I don't know what the exact number was in 1974 when I came here, but it probably would have been less than a, than a dozen. What entity can be more egalitarian than something where you're truly chosen based upon a raffle? or a system in which it is absolutely about inclusiveness. There's nothing exclusive about the college system. You cannot sign up for it. You cannot bid for it. You cannot interview for it. You cannot rush for it. It doesn't matter where your parents went through it. It's just about luck of the draw. And that, to me, epitomizes the Rice experience. So I came to Rice and matriculated into Jones College. And there in Jones College, I was walking to lunch one day, and I saw the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And she was a sophomore. And I thought, wow, she's really pretty. So later on, I was in the dorm room, and I said, I wonder if there's any more Mexicans here. So I put on some Tejano music, and I turned it really loud. And I thought, if there are, they'll come. And a little bit later, the girl that I saw, who I thought was very, you know, very attractive, and I thought she was very pretty, came into my room with her friend and they said, hey, you're playing some good music, are you, are you Tejano? I said, yeah, I'm from Texas. Hey, us too. And that's really, our, that's really how we got to know each other. And we would go dancing at the rice dances and we would go out salsa dancing, we'd go out Tejano dancing or cumbia dancing. And uh, you know, she didn't really have a dance partner at rice. And, and so music, meeting in the dorm rooms, that's how we met and the rest is history. Now we. We got married, had a daughter together in New York City, and we're very happy. When people ask me, uh, what were you exposed to, or what did you expose Rice to? I, w I like to say Spanish music. You know, I used to go to parties, there was no Spanish music. Uh, it was very different. We started bringing uh, mariachi every now and then to campus, bringing mariachi to the coffee house. Probably not done th before, but we did that. Um, you know, every now and then at some parties, we'll request some Spanish songs, try to mix it in there, and. Uh, that was something that we saw was being well received by, by many folks. Uh, and I think that was one of our contributions during that time, during the, the mid 90s to, to rice. We, we gave it a little uh, flavor there, a little salsa. Um, when I was here, I founded the Designing with Rice Engineers for Achievement Through Mentorship Program, the Dream Program. And it was named Dream because coming to rice was a dream for me. And when I sit down at my desk every day working uh, my dream job of working on the space shuttle program and now on commercial spacecraft, I look back and I think, you know, what were the things that mattered that got me to where I am today? And it's mentors. And when I look at the typical Rice student, mentors make or break when it comes to coming to a place like Rice. And so our Rice students go out to these high schools in their own cars, fighting Houston traffic, to go out and mentor and share their personal story, to give them that 
college application say, you can do this, when they stand in front of Lovett Hall and you see their facial expression of what it means to walk into this campus, boy, it, it changes their mind. I know it's changing their mind in terms of what opportunities are now open to them because they stepped on this campus. And one of those kids um, is Omero Benavides, and he now goes to U of H, is about to graduate as an engineer, and right now he interns with NASA working just down the street from me. That's when I know that the power of rice, the power of, of engineering, and the power of just being, being truly that role model, which you don't choose to be, but it just happens when you come here to rice, is just that important. Um, it really is. But the one thing that to me was so important is that to recognize that not every was as fortunate as I was. And, uh, and I felt a little bit uncomfortable sometimes when I would walk on campus going from one building to another. And I would see all these Latino men uh, mowing the grass and cleaning the place. And, and I felt somewhat of a, a discomfort, uh, feeling that would they feel bad that I here was a Latino like them. But I was privileged to be attending this incredible institution and they were not. So I was sitting there having my lunch, and one of these maintenance workers that was cutting the grass came in and sat next to me. And, and I was really puzzled. I thought, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Um, but I didn't have to wait very long. He said, you know what? He said, are you a student here? And I said, yes, I am. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, and I really hated to say it, but I, you know, I had to say, well, you know, I'm working on my PhD. Uh, and this guy put his arm around it and said, you know what, we're so proud of you. We're glad to be able to help you. Even if we, the little things that we do, like cutting the grass, cleaning the buildings, makes it easier for you to get an education, that we feel good about it. And uh, that made a big impact. I'm about to start my eighth year of teaching. Um, and ever since I started teaching, I cannot see myself being in a school other than a school that is full of students that come from underprivileged backgrounds, such as the one that I come from, um, because I really felt and I really feel that my calling in life is to be a role model to these students. And it wasn't t until I took Dr. Emerson's race and ethnic relations course that really solidified the fact that I needed to be an educator and I needed to be a teacher in a classroom. Um, that came about one day, we were in Dr. Emerson's class, a race and ethnic relations course, and there was over 100 students there. And he said we were going to do an activity outside um, in the quad. And so all 100 of us proceeded to go outside, and he said we're going to run a race. And, you know, whoever runs the race is going to get this candy bar. And it's like, oh, yes, I want a Snickers. Um, and so he lined us up, and he said, you know, before I tell you to go, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And so he proceeded to ask about 30 questions that involved, you know, if you grew up in a household where you lived check to check, take a step back. If you grew up in a household where you had more than 100 books, take two steps forward. If you grew up in a household where you didn't have health insurance, take a step back. And so after he was done asking all these questions, I stop and I look around and out of 100 students, I was the one dead last in the back. And at that point, I realized that, you know, I'm here at this university with all these other people that started at different points, you know, that had privileges or didn't have privileges, who um, af were afforded opportunities that I weren't afforded, but yet I was standing in this quad with all of them, getting the same education. And so really brought to light that college or university education is really the place where you can have your level playing field, where from that is your platform where you can move on and further your career, regardless of where you come from and regardless of your background. It is really important for me to see more Latinos get educated and for Rice to play a bigger role than he does today in encouraging that to occur. You know, Texas has the fastest growing Latino population in the country. And when you look at kindergarten to sixth grade, the Latino population already makes over half of those children which means, like it or not, that's the future of Texas. So what an opportunity for Rice, in my view, to help mold the future of Texas. But fear and I had to have a bigger impact on that Latino population.
I've been told since I was little that education is the equalizer, and it is evident in the United States that it is the equalizer. I can tell you that at Rice, I learned to have courage in my convictions and to back up my convictions. You know, one of the things that I think many of us who have been privileged and experienced some success in life uh, sometimes tend to forget that, that, you know, serendipity plays a big role in many of these things and luck plays a big role in many of these things. And being born into the right family, into the right country, into the, all of those things play a big role. Um, but we learn quickly that to be able to take advantage of that serendipity and that luck and that opportunity and those things that we have no control over, but they were presented to us, is to be educated. That if you have an education, your probability of being able to take advantage of those things is so much higher. Uh, I came to Rice in 2000, and a professor I had met at U of H when I worked as a summer gopher student assistant recommended I meet Richard Tapio. So I knocked on his door and said, someone said I should meet you. Here I am. Can I have a job? Uh, so I ended up working on a project based on a Chevelle that he had. He had a 1970 Chevelle Supersport that he was doing completely full custom. And he wanted to create a music video that had the car and that had special effects of the car turning into fire and have, turning into fireballs and fire coming out of the car and through the car and around the car. And he said, can you make this music video? I really wanted to use mathematical software to create it so I can tie my math background and the car, which is a hobby, together. And I said, no, I don't know how to do that. And he said, we'll pay you. I said, OK, I'll do it. So I put it together, and I failed miserably. So I went to Richard Tapia's office, and he said, well, that's great. I said, no, I just told you I'm, nothing's working. He said, well, that's great, because you tried something new, and you learned something. I said, well, yeah, that's true. I did. He said, well, I'm a professor. You're a student. You learned something. I did my job. Good. If the whole thing ends up in a failure, fine. At least you tried. At least you learned something, and he tried something new. So I went back to the drawing board, and it really freed me up to fail. And that was important. I said, I can fail. It's OK. And one thing that Richard Tapia always says is, you don't publish your failures. It's OK to fail. No one sees it. Don't publish it. You publish your successes. And it was the first time that I took all of the different aspects of my life. You know, I grew up in the barrio. And on Sundays, the Lowriders would cruise Mason Park, where I grew up. And every Sunday, I would go see the Lowriders cruise. And then I would go to the car shows every, you know, when they would have the Lowrider car shows or the custom car shows. And that was one aspect of me. And I was an art major as well, and that was another aspect of me. But I really liked math. But these were all distinct aspects, I thought. But within this project, and through Richard Tapia's mentorship, I saw that actually I can take all of my different loves and all of my different passions and put it together and make something that was greater than the sum of the whole. So in the music world, I was always thought of as the statistician who does music. In the uh, statistics world, I was always thought of the musician who did statistics. And uh, it was a similar analogy to, I guess, my identity as a Chilean American when I would go to Chile and, and here as well. Um, and now, I, like, I think I feel I've finally um, gotten to a point where I feel comfortable as a musician, as a statistician, as a Hispanic, and as a, an American. When I come on Rice's campus now and I see the diversity, it really pleases me because it's opened up the doors to, to so many very talented youth who in the past did not have the opportunity to go into an institution like Rice and get a great education. And we do have the prestige. I mean, we, without a doubt, we were, anyone who graduated from Rice was was looked at with some honor because it had been an accomplishment to be able to graduate from Rice. May 10th, 1997. You know that that was my graduation day. Um, you know there I am standing on, on the edge of the 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 stage there w waiting for my name to be called, and that's when I hear Dr. Hutchinson say Marco Antonio Leal, and you know it was just a great moment for me. You know um, things kind of shut down for a while, just walked across shook hands, very proud moment, uh, took the diploma, went back to, to my seat, and still couldn't believe it. You know, I remember I looked down at the diploma, make sure my name was there, make sure it said BSME, 
97. I'm like, all right, this it's real, it's happening. Um, so after ceremony, walked out, went to go look for my parents, um, get pictures with them and everything. And uh, one of the things I did, uh, handed the diploma to my mother. Um, they had supported me through the whole time, so I figured it was appropriate that that was uh, my gift to them. Also, May 10th happens to be Me uh, Mexico's Mother's Day. So that was my, my present to my mom, the diploma. And even to this date, the diploma hangs in, in her wall at her house. To me, Rice University is a microcosm to what Houston, really Texas, and ideally the United States should be all about, and to some degree remains. It is, I think, the most non-elitist institution you can be a part of. It is not about what you look like. It's not about where you came from, your economic wealth. It's about your smarts. And it's not just about being smart. The concept is, ideally, when we leave, we're not just class smart. We've got the wisdom. We've been very united at Rice, and I continue to be very as supportive as I can. Even as a teacher, even when my salary was $325 a month, I sent something to Rice because I felt that I had come here on a full scholarship. Everybody in my generation was on a full scholarship. So I, I, owed, I owed Rice, and I owed, you know, everybody who'd helped me. Mostly it's been when, when you have an ability or, a, or something that you can share with others, you should do it. That's the only way that you get some self-satisfaction that the gifts that you've been given and the, ability, and the opportunities that you've had are not wasted. And you just don't keep them to yourself, you share them with others. So what, would, what advice would I give students? Well, I think one of the most important lessons that I've learned is that you really need to step outside of your comfort zone. You need to try out new things when you get the chances. And it's hard to do that sometimes, especially for Latino, Hispanic students, because we're always so much in the spotlight. Uh, especially during my time frame, uh, there were a lot of situations that came up where people would either outwardly or maybe covertly say, you know, this person is here simply because of affirmative action. And so you feel like you're this little goldfish in a bowl and everyone is looking at you and every move that you make is being watched and scrutinized just to see if you're going to fail or not. And so that makes it very difficult to do anything at all, much less take any kind of a risk. But that's exactly, that is exactly what you need to do to succeed. You need to be able to take chances, you need to be able to take on those big projects, even when you don't think you can make them or do them, and just give it your all. When I came to Rice, when I work with the high school students, when I go out and give a talk and I tell them my personal story, my personal journey, I tell them, you know, work hard, be nice, but more importantly, dream big. Without this education, without this degree, I wouldn't be the person I am today and I'm excited as to what impacts future Rice students and what our alumni today will have on our community.